Ever wonder how quantum mechanics flips reality? Welcome back everyone. Today, we'll explore the parity operator, quantum mechanics reflection tool. With all this talk about symmetry, you might wonder, what do even and odd functions have in common with quantum physics? Discover how the parity operator transforms our understanding of symmetry with its eigenvalues of plus and minus one. Cool. As we see here a couple questions ago, we actually looked at the parity operator as a reflection. As you see with this picture here, we have something pointing up in the XYZ plane, and then it gets inverted over here. But this was also a composition of a mirror reflection and a rotation. So that's a pretty cool picture to tie together what we saw last time. Now, moving forward though, what we see here is an application of parity for a quantum mechanics state and wave function. So as you see, it's critically important for us and we'll dive into more about why this is the case. Let's see what our problem is. The problem statement for today is pretty short and simple. We want to show that the parity operator in um, for one dimension, which can be extended to three, is Hermitian. Recalling that Hermitian means that the operator is equal to its adjoint or the complex conjugate transpose. Part B, we want to show that the eigenvalues of the parity operator are plus and minus one. Why do we care? Well, the parity operator, when acting on wave functions, can only yield two eigenvalues, each associated with a specific symmetry of the wave function under spatial inversion. Very cool. So, you know, there is a lot to say here, and clearly with Sean Carroll's uh, clip that we just posted, Getting these symmetries in our brain is very important. As a reminder, there is a free companion PDF to help you follow along. All you have to do is access it using the link below. Without further ado, let's dive into this question. All right, so clearly in stop one, this will be pretty quick. All we're trying to do is prove the hermicity of the parity operator, which is defined by this statement here which we saw back in chapter three with the equation 3.17. Cool. So by remembering that we have to use an inner product to show that we can maneuver this parity operator, let's just let it act on G. Okay. You know, we've seen this before. What we know about parity operator is it inverts the, uh, the argument here. So we have an inversion of the function. So that gives us G of negative X, but clearly by a quick U sub, while well, letting u equal negative x and therefore x equal negative u, we get du equal negative dx and therefore dx equals negative du. Pretty quick, pretty simple. Let's plug these in and see what needs to be simplified. Of course, when dealing with u subs, it's often easier just to change the bounds instead of writing them as a function. So what we do here is plug u in, but of course, since u is negative x, all this does is flip the signs. So we have a negative sign up here, a positive sign there. Variables are substituted in. So we have a very familiar form of the same thing. Note here that the negative from the du and the order of the signs gets flipped at the cost of the negative. So we can take care of that. Very cool. And as you can see, we end up with f star of negative u times g of u, which of course we can write the conjugate on the outside. And therefore what we see is f of negative u gives us the parity operator on f of u. Very cool. And if you want to here, you could relabel these as x. I don't like doing that since we already had x in there, but the concept told that this is the same definition of the inner product, but with the parity operator acting on f. Therefore, we show that f, uh, the inner product of f and parity on g is equal to the parity on f, inner product with g for all f and g in the Hilbert space. Thus, we can conclude that the parity operator is Hermitian. Not too bad at all. This was pretty quick and pretty straightforward. We've seen this time and time again in chapter three and a couple times in the rest of the book. So Hermitian tells us a lot about what we need. Recall that Hermitian operators are the operators that we need for the observables, i.e. observables are Hermitian operators. Keep that in mind and we'll proceed forward. All right, so now when we want to prove 
what the eigenvalues are of the parity operator, we could take a couple routes. We could do a couple word salad arguments, but I think showing back the math is more important. And in this route, what we're going to focus on is the parity operator only. So what we need to what we need to create is an eigenfunction of psi of r of the parity operator satisfies the eigenvalue equation, which again we saw back in chapter three in equation 3.22. So we see that the parity operator acting on the eigenfunction leads to some scalar uh, artifact, which is when you deal in linear algebra, you see this a scaling factor of the same um, wave function itself. Cool. But if we apply the parity operator twice, what we see is that we end up with an inversion by one operation. Because remember, the square here just means how many times you apply it. So we have. Um, after one application, we get the argument is inverted. Cool, we saw the inversion factor there. If we apply it again, we get the same function back. What does this conclude? Well, it concludes that applying the operator twice yields the identity. And if we multiply the left-hand side and the right-hand side by the inverse, we see that getting one parity operator by itself is equal to its inverse. Thus, we conclude that the parity operator is a unitary operator. This is very important, and we could see how we have a whole classification of unitary operators, Hermitian operators, and sometimes they overlap, and when they do, they lead to great results. But now, this is only part of the problem. We still have to find out what the eigenvalues are. Let's see how we do that. Okay. So to find the eigenvalues, all we have to do is use this uh, squared relationship that we just saw. However, instead of applying it twice um, and undoing the inversion, what we want to do is use the eigenvalue equation. So by seeing that we have a pi or the parity squared acting on the side of R, split that up into two operations. And by when you do that, you get to see the parentheses here is the eigenvalue equation, so we just substitute in the lambda psi r. Cool, but we know that operators don't act on scalars, so we push this on through. Um, and when we do that, we see that we get, yet again, another application of the eigenvalue equation, because you, you have the parity operator acting on psi, so you get another eigenvalue. Thus, we have lambda squared whenever we have a parity squared, and we're fine with that because we showed that parity squared is equal to the identity. And in the case of scalars, this identity gets broken down into one, okay? So what we really end up with is lambda squared equals one, which tells us that lambda needs to equal plus or minus one, which was the goal in the first place. So, you know, not too bad in reality, and this technique of course is used in other applications, think about the projection operator, right with this we also get two very good results we see here that from the eigenvalue equation again if we plug these two lambdas in we get two very good results one says that the even functions take the lambda equal one okay well inversion right if we're the same before and after inversion we know we're even if we're opposite after inversion right the opposite sign comes out we know we're an odd function and this is the even odd symmetries of spatial inversion. Why, why, why do we like this? Well, think about all the wave functions about the origin. Or think about something like the harmonic oscillator, which was an even potential. Right? Think about all the applications that can come from that, especially in three dimensions. Very cool. That being said, there is another route to take, so let's dive into that. Okay, so route two instead of dealing with parity as a specified case, let's deal with operators in general, okay? And this will lay down a foundation where you can take from later. So if we consider the perspective of unitary operators U in general, for any vectors, alpha and beta, which live in the Hilbert space, because again, this is quantum mechanics, it's all Hilbert space. We see that by taking the inner product of these transformed vectors, right? we can have a remarkable result. Because we know that an operator is unitary, we could take the adjoint and put it over to the left-hand side. Let me get my pen out. Um, 
So we see that we put this on the side at the cost of the dagger. Okay, that we saw back in chapter three. No big deal. What we do notice, however, is that u dagger i is equal, or u dagger u is equal to the identity matrix as a definition. That is awesome. And so since the identity is multiplying by the vector alpha, we just get alpha beta. And notice that this equation of u acting on alpha, u acting on beta gives us the inner product of alpha beta. This tells us that it preserves norms, which we talked about last time too. Because this is so valuable in quantum mechanics with the probability densities, we need this to occur, and these have a, a very high importance to us in this theory. And then we can dive into the representations of SU2, SU3, and the whole ordeal there, which will be for another time. But very important that we see that unitary preserves norms, and this is why we study them. That being said, for this question, we see that the eigenvalue equation tells us that u acting on alpha gives us another lambda acting on alpha 2. So if we apply the same concept of the square operation in the parity case, but with the inner products, we see that we have u alpha, u alpha, which gives us lambda alpha, lambda alpha, and then we could take these scalars out. So we have uh, for the left hand side, get my pen back, we have this one is associated with complex conjugate. Because again, on that side of the broquette, in the inner product, this was the conjugated side. This one goes here. So we see very much the case that we end up with a magnitude squared with the inner product. But also note that the left-hand side from right before it is equal to the inner product as well of just alpha alpha. So what we can say is that for alpha, uh, for the inner product of alpha, if it doesn't equal zero, these two sides cancel and we're left with one e, or rather that lambda squared is equal to one. So this tells us that the unit modulus of lambda has to be one. And this could be any conjugate pair of numbers that lie on the complex unit circle. This is why we saw e to the i theta in the group theory representation because it can be any of them so long as they're conjugate pairings. This, however, has several solutions to it, so we can't just rely on the definition of unitary for this problem. We also have to use the pairing with Hermitian operators, and let's see what we can do with that. So, you know, we had a whole chapter on what it meant to be a Hermitian operator, why they're important, etc., and let's just revisit that for a second. For a Hermitian operator, the eigenvalue equation is q alpha equal lambda alpha, nothing new there. However, we showed what the eigenvalues were back in chapter 3.31, and let's just take a look at how to do that. Again, back to the inner product, we see that we have alpha q alpha, and this leads to the eigenvalue equation, so put the alpha, or put the lambda in there, and then you can take the lambda out because it's a scalar. Cool, the inner product stays. However, this same inner product can be written with the definition of Hermitian, and the operator can be put on the left-hand side, and thus you get the lambda on the left-hand side of the broquet. But we know that we could pull this out with the conjugation fact or factor on it, and what we see here is that both of these are the same inner products, so these two things have to be equal. This inner product and this inner product have to be the same thing, they have to equal. And if they equal, what does this tell us? Well. Again, assuming that lamb or excuse me, assuming that the inner product is not zero, right? Then we can say exclusively or explicitly, not exclusively, that lambda uh, conjugate is equal to lambda. This only works if lambda is real, right? Because remember, if I have um, a complex number, I uh, don't know, if I have a complex number of a to the i b right a plus b i and i hit the conjugate on that i have a minus b i but the real part of a itself does not change so if my conjugate equals my non-conjugate then i know i'm real so that's a very cool result and with these two things put together i compare the unity and the hermitian conditions for the eigenvalues and the only pair of numbers that actually satisfy that they're real 
and her conjugate pairings is lambda equal plus or minus one as the only available options. So once again, we show that the eigenvalues of the parity operator are plus or minus one. That is amazing, and we can see why we need these, <clears throat> but also be aware that these things will just be added to a long list of things you need to know. So keep that running tally notebook with you, and we'll see you at the next one. So in summary, we got to see a lot of different moving parts. This you know, could have been done in five minutes if we really just tried to run through it. But I think it's better to see a couple different aspects to help broaden the problem solving methodologies that you have. And also just kind of pair old results to new results and how they link together. It's often easy just to forget about old results once you just get through the homework set and not see how their applicability happens in other aspects. So keeping it constantly refreshed is going to help us as we elaborate on a theory. So great to see that. And of course, in summary, we see the eigenvalues, how to find them, and their importance. So I think I'm going to stay keeping up with the why do we care slide in the beginning because they have value later. But with that being said, I need to give a massive thank you to our patrons for their invaluable support, making all of this possible. Please consider subscribing and sharing to fuel this curiosity or even becoming a patron yourself. New content is posted weekly to aid you in your curious pursuits, including things that are not going to be available on YouTube and some supplemental work and research. Books, notes, and other reference materials are found below. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. The stuff is so fun and it all ties together in weird, mysterious ways. As always, thank you for watching, and until next time, stay curious.